Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you blessed the wedding at Cana by your presence, and there you turned water into the finest wine. Throughout this blessed Lent, fill our hearts with joy and make us worthy to reflect upon your miracles and your teachings, to clothe ourselves with penance and to strengthen ourselves with prayer and good works. We glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to God the Father who in his love invited all people to the wedding banquet of his only begotten Son, and to the Son, the heavenly Bridegroom, who in his love accepted the invitation to the wedding banquet at Cana, where he changed water into wine, and to the Holy Spirit, who by his descent invites us to share in the banquet of the Father and the Son. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ, the only begotten Son, on this day you chose to sit among the invited guests, enriching them with the abundance of your divine gifts. As your disciples believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we also believe in you. In place of the old law, you have given us the, your new gospel. And instead of the fruit of the vine, you have quenched our thirst with the chalice of your redeeming blood. Now, O Lord, we ask you at the fragrance
fragrance of this incense and through the intercession of your Virgin Mother, whose request you granted, that we may always drink of your holy wine, quenching our thirst with your heavenly love. May your light shine upon the world, and may we know that you are the spring of living water from which we may drink. O Lord, bless our families in our Lenten journey, that we may reach the harbor of salvation, which is the glorious feast of your resurrection. We glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, forever. true vine, and in your great and indescribable love, you were pressed upon the cross, producing new wine, which quenches the thirst of the church and all people. Now accept the fragrance of our incense and strengthen us, that we may fast with pure hearts and with sincere penance and become worthy to share in your holy banquet. To you be glory and thanks to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. <clears throat> Kadi Shant Aloha Kadi Shant
Let your servants, Lord, thank you, for you made the water wine. Let your saints glorify you when your majesty will shine. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus Christ that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, it is unclean for someone who thinks it's unclean. If your brother is being hurt by what you eat, your conduct is no longer in accordance with love. Do not, because of your food, destroy him for who Christ died. So, do not let your good be reviled, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by others. Let us then pursue what leads to peace and to building up one another. For the sake of food, do not destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone be to become a stumbling block by eating. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Keep the faith that you will yourself have in the presence of God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubts is con condemned if he eats because this is not from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Glory and honor of the Most Holy Trinity. They burn this and Kiri Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle John writes, on the third day, there was a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, 
and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine had run short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what is that to me and to you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for ceremonial washing according to Jewish custom, each holding about 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter had tasted the water that had become wine without knowing where it had come from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and he said to him, everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and so he revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. This is the truth, peace be with you. Do not destroy the work of God because of food. All things indeed are clean, but it is evil for a man to eat, causing scandal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This miracle, or the first sign, as St. John calls it, in Cana of Galilee at the wedding feast, has always been interpreted by the fathers and especially in the East, even more insignificantly, as being the wedding between Christ and his church. Not, we don't even know who the couple is in Cana of Galilee. We think because of the connection of one of the first four disciples is Nathaniel, who is from Cana, that the reason this invitation came in. But the primary aspect of the festivity that takes place is this signification of the beginning of our Lord's ministry. This is the very beginning of the three years. And it's initiated by the mother of God. She's the one who says to him, there's no wine. She begins this initiation to start with him. And that's why he says to her, woman, only twice when he addresses her by this title, woman, is the beginning of the three years and the second time will be on Calvary. We considered those reasons last year, why? And I don't want to focus upon the gospel. But she initiates this, and it's why he says to her, what is that to me and to you? Which is the Hebrew way of saying, this is not our concern. But it's also clear when he says to her that my hour has not yet come. It's not time for us to start this yet. She ignores that. And she looks at the waiters and she says, do whatever he tells you. And he picks it up and he performs this first sign. But he's telling her the relationship. What you're beginning here now is the work of redemption. And those are actually the last words that we have recorded in the Gospels of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do whatever he tells you. We see her again in the Gospel throughout the next three years, but we never hear her speak again recorded. 
And so what the great emphasis today and the reason why this miracle is placed on this first Sunday of Lent is because we begin a whole journey of the great fast. We begin a journey of light. It is amazing to see the number of times that light is referred to in the prayers of the church today. You'll notice in the Husoyo on this aspect of the divine wedding. You have it in the fact that in the Husoyo we refer to our Lord as being the bridegroom who deigned to accept the invitation to the people's wedding in Cana. Or in the Fetgomo following the reading, taken from the book of Revelation, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's the eschatological vision of the end of the world when the new Jerusalem will descend, as it says, arrayed as a bride for her groom. The great end of the world, this glory and triumph, is seen as a wedding. And by our baptism, that is our invitation. We begin this course towards this great triumphant banquet of life and glory within the life of the Holy Trinity. And that whole movement is something that we reenact by our fasting periods. <clears throat> really, the only fasting period we have left is we do Lent. But of course, historically, according to our tradition, and the patriarch himself last Easter, last Lent, wrote a whole encyclical on fasting and our tradition. And the fasting is not only the great Lent, the great fast that we have now, but also the season of announcements. We've forgotten that the season of announcements is a fasting season. Or the two weeks before the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. Most of us aren't even aware of that. Two weeks before the Assumption, it's kind of disappeared. We've done a great accomplishment at the second half of the 20th century of kind of sweeping away all these traditions. But what the fast is meant to do, notice in the hymn that we sang, that it brings wings to the spirit, that we are able to soar on high. But you'll notice the first two verses that are there in the, the, the verses that are in the Masmuro is that the, his majesty will shine. Fasting is a clarification of the mind. Fasting is a clarification of the heart. Clarification doesn't mean an explanation. Clarity, clarus in Latin, means to be shining. So clarity is literally the quality of shining. The woman's name, Claire, she means the bright one. The name itself, Clara. And so what we do with this whole season, and we prayed this morning in Safro, is that God give light to our spirits, God give light to our eyes, that we may see his commandments and follow his path. This is a transformation of the way that we think and the way that we act, which is why we have this epistle chosen for us today from the letter to the Romans. This is chapter 14 to the Romans. And remember, the letter to the Romans, as we mentioned before, is slightly more than halfway through our Lord's, uh, the, uh, St. Paul's apostolate, late 50s. So he's going to be dead within the next two years by his martyrdom. So when he's writing this letter in the midst of it, he's dealing with these churches which have now been around for 10, 15 years, 20 years, some of them. And in Rome, of course, the great cosmopolitan city of the world at that time, estimated about a million people lived in Rome at the time of St. Paul. It's an amazing factor to have the infrastructure to be able to have a million people live in a place who aren't growing their own food. You have to bring food in to feed these million people. And of course, after the collapse of Rome, we never see that number again until Victorian London in the 19th century, when another city finally hits a million people, 20, almost 20 centuries later. So in the midst of this cosmopolitan city, the parish of Rome, the church of Rome, has both people coming from a Jewish background and a pagan background, in their baptism and their profession of faith of the Messiah. And what St. Paul is emphasizing here in this two chapters, 14 and 15, a letter to the Romans, is not about eating, even though it's all about food. It's not about food, it's about the way we think and the way we judge and the way we act. It's about our minds, the clarity of our minds. And Christians have always thought differently 
than everybody else around them because of that light of the gospel. Now, in an individual Christian's life, that light may become more and more obscure, and then they will just simply think like everyone else in their generation, in their community. Sadly, we've arrived at that level within the Catholic Church in America, because apparently any kind of polling done of the Catholic population, they basically divide up just like everybody else for abortion, against abortion, all these things, which is boggling the mind because it means these people have not embraced the light of the gospel or they have walked away from it to have this kind of confusion and division. And so what St. Paul is already dealing with in that first generation is the sense of solidarity, what makes Christians be in their oneness that the solidarity that is given to us by the gospel, by our faith, by our baptism, that the solidarity is not found in nature. It's not just the community around us. It's not CNN and watching television. But if we don't embrace the gospel, then our principles of thought will be the television, will be the internet. Because we have to have some principles in our mind by which we think and judge. And St. Paul is telling them in chapter 14 is that the first, four, the first 12 verses, what we have read is from verse 14 onward. So the first verses leading up to this, he's reminding the Christians in Rome is that our solidarity, our oneness as a body of people is not our heritage, is not our background, but our solidarity is not in nature, it's not in our background, it's not in politics. Our solidarity is in Christ. Our oneness is that body of Christ, which is why when we mention that the reason for the sign of Cana that the fathers interpret as being the wedding feast of Christ and the mystical body, his church, is because in the Syriac tradition, in our tradition, the church has a pre-existence with God even before the dawn of creation that this movement toward the wedding banquet of the Lamb is a movement to something which has pre-existence from all eternity because they are the blessed ones within that light, in that unity with God. And St. Paul says, now in time, the world that we live in now, our solidarity, our oneness is with Christ, not anything else. And so he tells them that this is an inauguration of a new era. This is a new time. This is a new nature. This is a new creation, he uses as a term. And a new social order, which is why the Western world was transformed, why the Mediterranean basin was transformed over the next centuries, because it began with people who thought differently. And making reference to these polls of American Catholics these days, it is completely in the opposite direction. We are just simply drowning and submerging in the way that modern paganism thinks because we have lost our mind of Christ. We have lost our sense of the solidarity of the light which is given to us by the gospel. And so what St. Paul is saying in these first 12 verses is this should be the way you judge these things because what is he dealing with? Now we arrive at the question of the food. Because for the Jews who come from the background, <clears throat> but are Christians now, they have been reared on the law of Moses. And in the law of Moses, there is a clear demarcation between clean foods and unclean foods. So we've mentioned to you, one of the things that would go under unclean and never be able to eat is lobster. Bad. But being that the case, it means that the person who's sitting next to you in the pew in Rome in this first generation has an ook factor about you picking up whether well, or not eating lobsters in Rome, but oysters, let's say, from out of the sea. Those are also not allowed. And so your neighbor finds that repulsive. And you just vaunt yourself saying, yeah, there's nothing unclean, just eat it, get over it. You're not a Jew anymore. And St. Paul is saying, this is not the way the church is supposed to work. Which is why I began by the verse 20, which is from this epistle. Do not destroy the work of God because of food. Don't argue over these laws of Moses. I've mentioned to you I've lived in Europe. But if I tell Americans that we eat horse in Europe, most Americans kind of go, ugh. Because that's the cultural background we have been reared in. 
because we have a cowboy culture as our romantic culture. And it was the same thing for the Australians. They'll eat alligator, but to mention horse, and they're like, ooh, they get squeamish. But in Europe, they don't understand that. On the continent, they eat horse. The better for you anyways than cow, it's more lean. But having said that, culturally, there's a nook factor. So what St. Paul is saying is that you have to be aware of the fact that these people, that yes, there's nothing unclean. And objectively speaking, it's wrong to keep saying oysters are unclean. God made everything, nothing is unclean. That's why he continues that verse by saying, all things indeed are clean. It's true that everything's clean. And the other person, you know, should understand that, but they don't. But he says, but it is evil for a man to eat causing scandal. To invite them to your house for dinner, for example, and put oysters out and say, well, let's get over this now and just eat these things. He's saying, all oh, this is wrong. But not because of food, of what we eat or we don't eat. That's not the factor of St. Paul's. He's saying because you have to understand the unity of the body of Christ. That this solidarity of the mind of Christ should not be jeopardized by scandal. And as I've mentioned to you numerous times, the word scandal in Greek, skandalizein, literally means to trip someone up, to lift a paving stone, to make them fall. And he said, you're lifting stones that make these people trip up in their faith. What purpose is there? Well, because these things are not unclean and we don't follow the law of Moses. That's true. But why are you trying to ram it down their throats? You're offending charity. You're offending the church of God. You're defending. He says, do not destroy the work of God. You jeopardize it because of what you're doing. But most importantly, you are proving to the world and to your brothers and sisters that you do not have the mind of Christ. Because you are not being inspired first and foremost by the light of the gospel and by charity. And that's why the next verse is the beginning of chapter 15 is he's reminding them that all, everyone should be of one mind in Christ, both Jew and Gentile. There's one church predestined from all eternity before the creation of the world that is initiated in its visible manifestation at Cana by this first sign. You have been invited into it by your faith and baptism. So don't rip up the invitation by offending and isolating yourself from the mind of Christ. Invitations can be lost, can't they? That's why if you look again at the Husoyo, it makes reference that we have also been invited to this banquet. It does not say we are sitting there. We are initiated along a path which can be lost by our infidelity. And that's why Lent is a period of conversion. The turning towards the Lord and the turning towards interiorly so that I understand more profoundly where I'm coming from, where I am at, and we're all wounded, in order that I may see the obstacles that stand in the way toward that mind of Christ, that I may be transformed, and hence the prayers of this morning. Grant us light. Grant light to our eyes that we may see your commandments and follow your path that we may be transformed into this unity of the mind of Christ. It's a very, very beautiful and profound image of what the church is meant to be, the solidarity, which is why you have a long, long, long reflection in the bulletin this week. I'm sorry for it's long. We went for broke and decided let's do eight pages because we have the Lenten appeal and everything else in it. But in bringing it together, it's a reflection upon the individualism in which we live today. We are fragmenting and breaking up as people in the Western world. And when that fragmentation, we even use the word tribe. Well, that's my tribe. Well, that's your tribe. That's right. It's a horrible phraseology. It's a horrible vocabulary. Because it means by being a tribe, I'm something different, separated from you. And not only do we not, what do tribes do historically? They fight against each other all the time, which is exactly what we do in social media. And this is tragic. This is everything opposite of what St. Paul is trying to tell us of what Christ brought to the world, which was to bring this unity, which was to bring this healing, which was to bring this light and the mind of Christ. So that we must necessarily have a properly formed 
conscience. When we speak of the word conscience, the word itself literally means a knowledge with or alongside. Cum scientia. The word science just means knowledge. Conscience means the knowledge that I have within me along with my other knowledge that I learn, like how to tie my shoes. It's this interior knowledge which gives me a direction of the choices I'm supposed to make. And everyone has an obligation that their conscience be properly formed according to the gospel. That is part of what we also do during these next two months. We learn. We enter more profoundly into our faith so that we understand what the teaching of Christ is. And when I have that, then I'm not so keen on following just simply the principles of Fox News or CNN because I have my own way of thinking. I have a Christian conscience. And at that point, there truly is a Catholic way of thinking as there has been throughout the centuries. So that St. Paul says that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who judges a thing to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You make that poor brother of yours eat those lobsters at your house on that evening, you're forcing him to do something which, yes, he's misunderstanding. His conscience is not completely correct, but you're making him do something which he thinks is wrong. And you violate charity, which is much worse than what he's doing, but you make the poor man sin. So we have the obligation of developing a properly formed conscience. And hence, this week, we resume our adult religion classes on Wednesdays. This Wednesday we begin, we'll go over till the end of May. And so when we finish all of this consideration in these chapters of St. Paul, that our personal whims or our personal convictions or our personal ideas, they're fine but they do not take precedence over the mind of Christ. It's part of the hysteria in the modern world. You hear people standing out in front of him saying, well, the church is wrong on this. The church is wrong on that. The church needs to change this. I have never met a person who believed in women's ordination or uh, same-sex unions who in understanding what the church actually teaches on it, rather than what CNN tells them about what the church teaches them, them, haven't come to an understanding of the wisdom of the church. She's been around for 20 centuries. These are not new ideas. And so in that formation of our mind, the personal convictions, we can have all kinds of ideas politically, and that's fine. But in non-essential matters, we retain them, but the mind of Christ is something which supersedes so that the wisdom of choice and the thoughtful consideration of others in this one body of Christ will always take precedence. So that even when there is a disagreement with someone else, we can still discuss something. And that's why St. Paul is using this image of the Mosaic law of food to remind them that yes, you are objectively right to say that it no longer obliges us but you are wrong to try to impose that on everyone in their practice. And so he says, that's why we have the beautiful verse that we can finish with, that the kingdom of God is not in food and drink. It's not about oysters and lobsters. It's not about mixing meat with dairy products. He says the kingdom of God is not in food and drink, but it's in justice. Not political justice, but the propriety of balance and of order within our lives, justice in that sense, and of peace, the tranquility of order that flows from that justice and in joy. Joy within the Holy Spirit, why? Because we have been invited to this magnificent gift of the Supper of the Lamb. We have been invited and we have been given to possess what the greatest treasure on earth, which is redemption and healing and grace within the gospel. The definition of joy is the possession of a good. And when we understand that the mind of Christ is what is being formed in us because of this treasure that we possess, that has been bequeathed to us, that has been given to us by the Savior, then there can be nothing else but joy 
within the Spirit of God. And in that joy and that peace and that justice, we all together work toward that illumination of the mind of Christ within our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten God. Telvot made paint a loho, alvot a loho, dam hore talyot. When a silver tile to a hair, the light of my student, high and low, and good show. Peace. 
reach me, hands now lift me high above the altar. Alleluia, our gifts, Lord, receive. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, and St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Mary, St. Jude, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Catherine Drexel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those from the sacrifices offered for the repose of Samaya Ferris. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. O oh, Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss and the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord.
Lord, we bow before you to receive your blessings and assistance, for we are weak, and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us, deliver us from every evil, and blot out all our transgressions, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. abundant in mercy because of your love for us. You sent your Son into the world, and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary for our salvation. Waxoya beretar mi dao karo mara Saba khola mehne kol khum Ono deni tao Pahro dir Dahlo fai kun wakhlof sagiye Me taqaseo me tihem Khosoyan how may we hope not to alarm alarming? Amen. O kano al koso dam zikwa men hamro men mayo barehu kade shu ya bel talmi da karo mara. Sabishtaw mehne kul khuhu Ono deni tao Demo dil dia tiki khudato Dakhlo faikun wakhlof sagiye Mete shadu meti hamba Khusoyan haube wa khaye Nan qalam alameen Amen. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. 
May your mercy rest upon us. O oh Lord, we remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O mighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin morio, manin morio, manin morio, ni te modo rojo chayu kadisho. Una chena lainu al korbo no hono. By his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy, may those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul, and from every sin and receive eternal life. Accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Nasrallah Peter, our retired Patriarch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion unto all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord Remember, O oh Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. 
Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Favor, remember, O Lord, our brothers, parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for the Grant rest, O Lord, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed. With or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let each one of us look. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, Father one, one Holy Son. Son. One Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body. 
and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for a new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your holy cross and be their shelter and refuge. And perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So there are a few announcements at the beginning of Lent. Um, there will be tickets being sold by the Knights of Columbus for the St. Patrick's dinner that's coming up. After the, so the tickets being sold after Mass. You also have the recent edition that came out of the Maronite Voice for Lent, so you're highly encouraged to take a copy of the Maronite Voice. It also has the prescriptions like in the bulletin also for the fast of Lent. And that also brings us in the bulletin to the Lenten Appeal. And as a reminder, the Lenten Appeal is a tax on us, so we have to send the eparchy $4,000, whether you give it to the parish or not in the next for in the next seven weeks. And so the Lenten appeal. And then the next part is also that when we had problem of leakage in the rectory in the basement, just to let you know the next upcoming cost, apparently our intake line of the water for the rectory is as old as the house. And so the plumber who was here looking at it said, I don't even want to touch it because it was corroded. And of course, having it explode mean we have the 152 PSI water pressure of the system of the water city system just flooding the basement of the rectory. That didn't happen, thanks be to God, could happen tonight. But tomorrow they're supposed to come and fix this, also while we have mass and everything. So they're supposed to be fixing this brass piping in the morning uh, in the rectory. But that'll just be an extra cost. I throw it out there so you know what's coming up. And then lastly, of course, as I mentioned, we have the adult religion classes resuming this coming Wednesday. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.